Mark is a 30-year-old male who got into a fight outside a bar. His friends report that he was knocked unconscious in the altercation with a punch to the side of his head. After about 10 minutes after going unconscious, Mark awakens and tells his friends he feels fine. However, Mark begins to feel weak in his right arm and legs after 30 minutes. His friends immediately call an ambulance and Mark is taken away to the local A&E department. Hi, my name is John and in this week's episode of Modern Skin Deep, we will be covering the anatomy of the neurocranium and meninges in 6 minutes or less. Before we begin, here are the various sources we have used for this tutorial. Firstly, here is a lateral to medial view of the side of the skull from the right side. We will be covering the part of the skull which encapsulates the brain, known as the neurocranium. It is comprised of six bones, from anterior to posterior, these are the ethmoid bone, frontal bone, sphenoid bone, parietal bone, temporal bone, and lastly, the occipital bone. A handy mnemonic to remember the bones of the neurocranium is the pest of six. Notice each letter in the mnemonic correlates with the initials of one of the bones. Next here is a view of the skull from the top. To orientate ourselves, here is the frontal bone, parietal bones bilaterally, and occipital bone posteriorly. You will notice a zigzag pattern where the bones meet, and these are known as the sutures. From this view, we can observe three sutures. The coronal suture and sagittal suture, named according to the plane they sit in, and the lambdoid suture. The lambdoid suture is named after lambda, the 11th letter in the Greek alphabet, because the sutures mimic the letter's shape. The points where the sutures meet are also named. Anteriorly, we have the bragma, which is Greek for top of the head. It is located at the junction between the coronal and sagittal suture. Posteriorly, we have the lambda, which is the junction of the lambdoid and sagittal sutures. An important junction for sutures is the terion, which is located on the lateral aspect of the head. Teron is Greek for wing. Hermes, the messenger of the Greek pantheon, is commonly depicted with wings attached at the terion. It is important because a crucial vessel, the middle meningeal artery, lies underneath the terion. This means any fracture of the terion will likely lead to a laceration of the middle meningeal artery. Next, let us look at the branches of the arterial supply of the head and neck. We begin with the common carotid artery, which arises from either the right subclavian artery or the aortic arch, depending on the site you address. It bifurcates at the level of C4 into the external and internal carotid artery. The first branch of the external carotid artery is the superior thyroid artery, which supplies the thyroid gland and superior portion of the larynx. Next, we have the ascending pharyngeal artery, which supplies the soft palate and pharyngeal constrictors. The lingual artery supplies the tongue and palatine tonsils, while the facial artery supplies the muscles of facial expression and the skin overlying them. Next, we have the occipital artery, which supplies the back of the head. Then we have the posterior auricular artery, which supplies the back of the ear. The last two branches of the external carotid artery are the maxillary artery and superficial temporal artery. It is from the maxillary artery that we get the middle meningeal artery which enters the skull via the foramen spinosum. An easy way to remember these branches is via another mnemonic. It is called Some Anatomists Love Freaking Out Poor Medical Students. Similar to the mnemonic we saw earlier, the first letter of each word matches the first letter of each branch. Now let's take a deeper look into the skull. Here is a coronal section of the skull. Going from superficial to deep, we have the skin, dense connective tissue, galea aponeurosis, loose areolar tissue, and periosteum. The dense connective tissue layer is well vascularized, which is why damage to the scalp commonly results in profuse bleeding. The galea is a tendinous sheath which connects the frontalis and occipitalis muscles, which we use to raise our eyebrows. These structures form the layers of the scalp, which also has its own handy mnemonic known as scalp. Moving deeper, we have the three layers of the bony skull itself. The external table, diplo, and internal table, which all contribute to providing a rigid shell which protects the brain. An external layer of protection is provided by the meninges, which is Greek for membrane. The first layer is the dura mater, which is Latin for tough mother. It is aptly named because it adheres tightly to the internal table by attaching to the sutures of the skull from the inside. The dura mater is further divided into two layers, the periosteal layer, which hugs the surface of the internal table, and the meningeal layer, which follows the brain and spinal cord through foramen magnum. Next, we have the arachnoid mater, which is named due to its spiderweb-like projections, which run across the subarachnoid space and attach onto the pia mater. You will notice that the two layers of the dura mater encapsulates a blue fluid in the midline, and this is known as the superior sagittal sinus. There are three structures which invade the sinus. These are the emissary veins, which drain venous blood away from the head and act to cool down the brain. 
the arachnoid granulations, which are outpouchings of the subarachnoid space, which perforate the meningeal layer of the dura mater. They allow cerebrosplanar fluid to be reabsorbed into the venous system. Lastly, we have bridging veins, which drain blood from the cortex into the superior sagittal sinus. They are called bridging because they bypass the subdural space, which lies between the arachnoid mater and the meningeal layer of the dura mater. Between the internal table and periosteal dura is located a potential space known as the epidural space. Potential here meaning it does not exist under normal circumstances but expands due to a pathological cause such as a bleed. Now let's return to Mark receiving treatments in A&E. He is sent for a CT scan which reveals a hyperdense biconvex lesion on the left side. He is diagnosed with an epidural hemorrhage and is scheduled to receive a decompressive craniotomy. And there we go, the anatomy of the neurocranium and meninges in under 6 minutes. If you liked today's tutorial, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and comment below about what you would like to see next.